Hello folks, Alistair here. Please enjoy version 2 of Electronic Plague, read by the mighty Dave Robertson. A radio horror, created by a mad brain, menaced the world with destruction. The Electronic Plague, that infernal and unparalleled blight which spread over the country on the evening of September 10th, 1935, just after nightfall, when everybody was tuning up the radio. Casting street and house into utter darkness, stopping completely the machinery of civilization, and striking tens of thousands of persons unconscious, hundreds of them never to awake. The electronic plague has never been satisfactorily explained to the public. Few know the true story. Officials of the War Department have, locked securely away in their most secret vault, the device that caused the woeful disaster, and with it a document— The confession of Dr. Alexander Nash, its inventor, who himself died in the plague. Welcome to Pseudopod's Public Domain Showcase for 1925. Pseudopod, Episode 741, January 22nd, 2021. This week's story, Lakundu by Edward Lucas White. Hello everyone, welcome to Pseudopod, the weekly horror podcast. Our public domain showcase continues with this 1925 piece from Edward Lucas White. This was first published in Weird Tales in November of that month, and I don't want to give away spoilers, but if you were to look up the word carbuncle, that would give you an idea of where we're going. During his life, White was known for several historical novels that were critical and commercial successes. El Supremo in 1916, The Unwilling Vestal in 1916, and Andivius Hedulio in 1921, the latter two of which H.P. Lovecraft would later recommend to Fritz Lieber as the finest modern fictional reflections he'd read about the Roman Empire. Each of these three books went through a dozen printings and sold widely for more than a quarter of a century. However, weirdly, White remains best remembered for his contribution to weird fiction in this story. Your narrator this week is an old, dear friend of mine and an occasional partner in crime. A collection of random job titles wearing a variety of truly excellent suits, Phil Lunt is currently a casting booker for the film and TV industries. He still tries to find the time to act and write whilst having a... life. He doesn't sleep much. He's set to appear in the upcoming sci-fi fantasy audio drama Dreambound and was once a teabag in a Yorkshire tea commercial. Having an entry on the Star Wars Wikipedia for illustration work in a Star Wars book is still one of his greatest achievements. I've known Phil over a decade, and that is the first time I've ever found out that thing about him. I'm high-fiving you, my friend. I'm high-fiving you through the internet so hard right now. So, without further ado, we have a story for you. And we promise you, it's true. Lukundu by Edward Lucas White Narrated by Phil Lunt It stands to reason, said Twombly, that a man must accept the evidence of his own eyes, and when his eyes and ears agree, there can be no doubt. He has to believe what he has both seen and heard. Not always, put in Singleton softly. Every man turned towards Singleton. Twombley was standing on the hearth rug, his back to the grate, his legs spread out with his habitual air of dominating the room. Singleton, as usual, was as much as possible effaced in a corner. But when Singleton spoke, he said something. We faced him in that flattering spontaneity of expectant silence which invites utterance. I was thinking, he said, after an interval, of something I both saw and heard in Africa. Now, if there was one thing we had found impossible, it had been to elicit from Singleton anything definite about his African experiences. As with the alpinist in the story, who could only tell that he went up and came down, the sum of Singleton's revelations had been that he went there and came away. His words now riveted our attention at once. Twombly faded from the hearthrug, but not one of us could ever recall having seen him go. The room 
readjusted itself, focused on Singleton, and there was some hasty and furtive lighting of fresh cigars. Singleton lit one also, but it went out immediately, and he never relit it. Chapter One We were in the Great Forest, exploring for pygmies. Van Rieten had a theory that the dwarfs found by Stanley and others were a mere crossbreed between ordinary Negroes and the real pygmies. He hoped to discover a race of men three feet tall at most, or shorter. We found no traces of any such beings. Natives were few, game scarce. Food, except game, there was none. And the deepest, dankest, drippingest forest all about. We were the only novelty in the country. No native we met had even seen a white man before. Most had never heard of white men. All of a sudden, late one afternoon, there came into our camp an Englishman, and pretty well used up he was too. We had heard no rumour of him. He had not only heard of us, but had made an amazing five-day march to reach us. His guide and two bearers were nearly as done up as he. Even though he was in tatters and had five days' beard on, you could see he was naturally dapper and neat and the sort of man to shave daily. He was small, but wiry. His face was the sort of British face from which emotion has been so carefully banished that a foreigner is apt to think the wearer of the face incapable of any sort of feeling. The kind of face which, if it has any expression at all, expresses principally the resolution to go through the world decorously, without intruding upon or annoying anyone. His name was Etchum. He introduced himself modestly, and ate with us so deliberately that we should never have suspected, if our bearers had not had it from his bearers, that he had had but three meals in the five days, and those small. After we had lit up, he told us why he had come. My chief is very seedy, he said, between puffs. He is bound to go out if he keeps this way. I thought perhaps... He spoke quietly in a soft, even tone, but I could see little beads of sweat quosing out on his upper lip, under his stabby moustache, and there was a tingled, pressed emotion in his tone. A veiled eagerness in his eye, a palpitating inward solicitude in his demeanour that moved me at once. Van Rieten had no sentiment in him. If he was moved, he did not show it, but he listened. I was surprised at that. He was just the man to refuse at once, but he listened to Etchem's halting, diffident hints. He even asked questions. Who is your chief? Stone, Etchem lisped. That electrified both of us. Ralph Stone, we ejaculated together. Etchem nodded. For some minutes, Van Rieten and I were silent. Van Rieten had never seen him, but I had been a classmate of Stone's, and Van Rieten and I had discussed him over many a campfire. We had heard of him two years before, south of Lubo in the Balunda country, which had been ringing with his theatrical strife against a Balunda witch-doctor, ending in the sorcerer's complete discomfiture and the abasement of his tribe before Stone. They had even broken the fetish man's whistle and given Stone the pieces. It had been like the triumph of Elijah over the prophets of Baal only more real to the Balunda. We had thought of Stone as far off, if still in Africa at all, and here he turned up, ahead of us, and probably forestalling our quest. Chapter 2 Etchem's naming of Stone brought back to us all his tantalising story, his fascinating parents, their 
tragic death, the brilliance of his college days, the dazzle of his millions, the promise of his young manhood, his wide notoriety, so nearly real fame, his romantic elopement with the meteoric authoress whose sudden cascade of fiction had made her so great a name so young. Whose beauty and charm were so much heralded, the frightful scandal of the breach of promise suit that followed, his bride's devotion through it all, their sudden quarrel after it was all over, their divorce, the too much advertised announcement of his approaching marriage to the plaintiff in the breach of promise suit, his precipitate remarriage to his divorced bride, their second quarrel. And second divorce, his departure from his native land, his advent in the dark continent, the sense of all this rushed over me, and I believed Van Rieten felt it too, as he sat silent. Then he asked, "Where is Werner?" "Dead," said Etchem. "He died before I joined Stone." "You were not with Stone above Lubo." No," said Etchem. "I joined him at Stanley Falls." "Who is with him?" Van Rieten asked. "Only his Zanzibar servants and their bearers," Etchem replied. "What sort of bearers?" Van Rieten demanded. "Mang Batu men," Etchem responded simply. "Now, that impressed both Van Rieten and myself greatly. It bore out Stone's reputation." As a notable leader of men, for up to that time, no one had been able to use Mang Batu as bearers outside of their own country, or to hold them for long or difficult expeditions. Were you among the Mang Batu? Was Van Rieten's next question. Some weeks, said Etchem. Stone was interested in them and made up a fair-sized vocabulary of the words and phrases. He had a theory. That they are an offshoot of the Balunda, and he made much confirmation in their customs. What do you live on? Van Rieten inquired. Game mostly, Etchem lisped. How long has Stone been laid up? Van Rieten next asked. More than a month, Etchem answered. And you have been hunting for the camp? Van Rieten exclaimed. Etchem's face burnt and flayed as it was. Showed a flush. I missed some easy shots, he admitted ruefully. I've not felt very fit myself. What's the matter with your chief? Van Rieten inquired. Something like carbuncles, Etchem replied. He ought to get over a carbuncle or two, Van Rieten declared. They are not carbuncles, Etchem explained. Nor one or two, he has had dozens, sometimes five at once. If they had been carbuncles, he would have been dead long ago. But in some ways, they are not so bad, though in others they are worse. How do you mean, Van Rieten queried? Well, Etchem hesitated. They do not seem to inflame so. Deep, nor so wide as carbuncles, nor to be so painful, nor to cause so much fever. But then they seem to be part of a disease that affects his mind. He let me help him dress the first, but the others, he has hidden most carefully, for me and from the men. He keeps to his tent when they puff up, and will not let me change the dressings. Or be with him at all? Have you plenty of dressings? Van Rieten asked. We have some," said Etchem doubtfully. "But he won't use them. He washes out the dressings and, and uses them over and over. How is he treating the swellings?" Van Rieten inquired. He slices them off, clear down to flesh level, with his razor. What? Van Rieten shouted. Etchem made no answer, but looked him steadily in the eyes. 
I beg pardon, Van Reeden hastened to say. You startle me. Well, they can't be carbuncles. He'd have been dead long ago. I thought I said they are not carbuncles, Etchum lisped. But the man must be crazy, Van Reeden exclaimed. Just so, said Etchum. He is beyond my advice or control. How many has he treated that way? Van Reeden demanded. Two. Uh, to my knowledge, Etchum said. Two? Van Reeden queried. Etchum flushed again. I saw him, he confessed. Through a crack in the hut, I felt impelled to keep watch on him, as if he was not responsible. I should think not, Van Reeden agreed, and you saw him do that twice. I conjecture, said Etchum, that he did the like with all the rest. How many has he had? Van Reeden asked. Dozens, Etchum lisped. Does he eat? Van Reeden inquired. Like a wolf, said Etchum. More than any two bearers. Can he walk? Van Reeden asked. He crawls a bit, groaning, said Etchum simply. Little fever, you say? Van Reeden ruminated. Enough and too much, Etchum declared. Has he been delirious? Van Reeden asked. Only twice, Etchum replied. Once, when the first swelling broke, and once later. He would not let anyone come near him then. But we could hear him talking, talking steadily. And it scared the natives. Was he talking their patter in delirium? Van Reeten demanded. No, said Etchum, but he was talking some similar lingo. Hamed Berghash said he was talking Balunda. I know too little Balunda. I do not learn languages readily. Stone learned more Mang Batu in a week than I could have learned in a year. But I seem to hear words like Mang Batu words. Anyhow. The Mangbatu bearers were scared. Scared, Van Reeten repeated questioningly. So were the Zanzibar men, even Hamad Burghash, and so was I, said Etchum, only for a different reason. He talked in two voices. In two voices? Van Reeten reflected. Yes, said Etchum, more excitedly than he had yet spoken, in two voices, like a conversation. One was his own, one a small, thin, bleaty voice, like nothing I ever heard. I seemed to make out among the sounds the deep voice made, something like Mangbatu words I knew, as Nedru, Metababa, and Nedu, their terms for head, shoulder, thigh, and perhaps Kudra and Neker, speak and whistle. And among the noises of the shrill voice, Matumipa, Angunzi, and Kamomami, kill, death, and hate. Hamed Burghash said he also heard those words. He knew Mangbatu far better than I. What did the bearers say? Van Reeten asked. Oh, they said, Lukundu, Lukundu, Etchum replied. I did not know that word. Hamed Burkash said it was Mangbatu for leopard. It's Mangbatu for witchcraft, said Van Breeten. I don't wonder they thought so, said Etchum. It was enough to make one believe in sorcery, to listen to those two voices. One voice answering the other, Van Breeten asked perfunctorily. Etchum's face went grey under his tan. Sometimes both at once, he answered huskily. Both at once, Van Reeten ejaculated. It sounded that way to the men too, said Etchum, and that was not all. He stopped and looked helplessly at us for a moment. Could a man talk and whistle at the same time, he asked. How do you mean, Van Reeten queried. We could hear Stone talking away his big, deep-chested baritone rumbling away, and through it all we could hear a high, shrill whistle, the oddest, wheezy sound. You know, no matter how shrilly a grown man may whistle, 
The note has a different quality from the whistle of a boy or a woman or a little girl. They sound more treble somehow. Well, if you can imagine the smallest girl who could whistle, keeping it up tunelessly right along, that whistle was like that, only even more piercing, and it sounded right through Stone's bass tones. And you didn't go to him, Van Reeton cried. He is not given to threats, Etchum disclaimed. But he had threatened, not volubly, nor like a sick man, but quietly and firmly, that if any man of us, he lumped me in with the men, came near him while he was in his trouble, that man should die. And it was not so much his words as his manner. It was like a monarch commanding respected privacy for a deathbed. One simply could not transgress. I see said Van Rieten shortly. He's very seedy, Etchum repeated helplessly. I thought perhaps his absorbing affection for Stone, his real love for him, shone out through his envelope of conventional training. Worship of Stone was plainly his master passion. Like many competent men, Van Rieten had a streak of hard selfishness in him. It came to the surface then. He said we carried our lives in our hands from day to day just as genuinely as stone, that he did not forget the ties of blood and calling between any two explorers, but there was no sense in imperiling one party for a very problematical benefit to a man probably beyond any help, that it was enough of a task to hunt for one party, that if the two were united, providing food would be more than doubly difficult, that the risk of starvation was too great. Deflecting our march seven full days' journey, he complimented Etchum on his marching powers, might ruin our expedition entirely. Chapter 3 Van Rieten had logic on his side and he had a way with him. Etchum sat there, apologetic and deferential like a fourth-form schoolboy before a headmaster. Van Rieten wound up. I am after pygmies, at the risk of my life. After pygmies, I go. Perhaps then these will interest you, said Etchum very quietly. He took two objects out of the side pocket of his blouse and handed them to Van Rieten. They were round bigger than big plums, and smaller than small peaches, about the right size to enclose in an average hand. They were black, and at first I did not see what they were. Pygmies! Van Rieten exclaimed. Pygmies indeed! Why, they they wouldn't be two feet high! Do you mean to claim that these are adult heads? I claim nothing. Etchum answered evenly. You can see for yourself. Van Rieten passed one of the heads to me. The sun was just setting, and I examined it closely. A dried head it was, perfectly preserved, and the flesh as hard as Argentine jerked beef. A bit of vertebra stuck out where the muscles of the vanished neck had shriveled into folds. The puny chin was sharp on a projecting jaw, the minute teeth white and even between the retracted lips. The tiny nose was flat, the little forehead retreating. There were inconsiderable clumps of stunted wool on the Lilliputian cranium. There was nothing babyish, childish or youthful about the head. Rather, it was mature to senility. Where did these come from? Van Rieten inquired. I do not know, Etchum replied precisely. I found them among Stone's effects, while rummaging for medicines or drugs or anything that could help me to help him. I do not know where he got them, but I'll swear he did not have them when we entered this district. Are you sure? Van Rieten queried, his eyes big and fixed on Etchum's. They're sure lisped Etchum. 
But how could he have come by them without your knowledge? Van Rieten demurred. Sometimes we were apart ten days at a time, hunting, said Etchum. Stone is not a talking man. He gave me no account of his doings, and Hamed Burgash keeps a still tongue and a tight hold on the men. You have examined these heads? Van Rieten asked. Minutely, said Etchum. Van Rieten took out his notebook. He was a methodical chap. He tore out a leaf, folded it, and divided it equally into three pieces. He gave one to me and one to Etchum. Just for a test of my impressions, he said, I want each of us to write separately what he is most reminded of by these heads. Then I want to compare the writings. I handed Etchum a pencil and he wrote. Then he handed the pencil back to me and I wrote. Read the three, said Van Rieten, handing me his piece. Van Rieten had written, an old Balunda witch doctor. Etchum had written, an old Mang Batu fetish man. I had written, an old Katongo magician. There, Van Rieten exclaimed, look at that. There is nothing Wagabi or Batwa or Wambutu or Wabotu about these heads, nor anything pygmy either. I thought as much, said Etchum. And you say he did not have them before? To a certainty he did not, Etchum asserted. It is worth following up, said Van Rieten. I'll go with you. And first of all, I'll do my best to save Stone. He put out his hand, and Etchum clasped it silently. He was grateful all over. Chapter 4 Nothing but Etchum's fever of solicitude could have taken him in five days over the track. It took him eight days to retrace with full knowledge of it and our party to help. We could not have done it in seven and Etchum urged us on, in a repressed fury of anxiety. No mere fever of duty to his chief, but a real ardour of devotion, a glow of personal adoration for Stone, which blazed under his dry conventional exterior, and showed in spite of him. We found Stone well cared for. Etchum had seen to a good high thorns reba round the camp, the huts were well built and thatched, and stones was as good as their resources would permit. Hamed Berghash was not named after two Saeeds for nothing. He had in him the making of a sultan. He had kept the Mangbatu together, not a man had slipped off, and he had kept them in order. Also, he was a deft nurse and a faithful servant. The two other Zanzibaris had done some creditable hunting. Though all were hungry, the camp was far from starvation. Stone was on a canvas cot, and there was a sort of collapsible camp stool table, like a Turkish taborette, by the cot. It had a water bottle and some vials on it, and Stone's watch, also his razor in its case. Stone was clean and not emaciated, but he was far gone. Not unconscious but in a daze, past commanding or resisting anyone. He did not seem to see us enter or to know we were there. I should have recognised him anywhere. His boyish dash and grace had vanished utterly, of course. But his head was even more leonine. His hair was still abundant, yellow and wavy. The close, crisped, blonde beard he had grown during his illness did not alter him. He was big, big-chested yet. His eyes were dull, and he mumbled and babbled mere meaningless syllables, not words. Etchum helped Van Rieten to uncover him and look him over. He was in good muscle for a man so long bedridden. There were no scars on him except about his knees, shoulders and chest. On each knee and above it he had a full score of roundish cicatrices and a dozen or more on each shoulder, all in front. 
Two or three were open wounds, and four or five barely healed. He had no fresh swellings, except two, one on each side, on his pectoral muscles, the one on the left being higher up and farther out than the other. They did not look like boils or carbuncles, but as if something blunt and hard were being pushed up through the fairly healthy flesh and skin, not much inflamed. I should not lance those, said Van Reeden, and Etchem assented. They made Stone as comfortable as they could, and just before sunset we looked in on him again. He was lying on his back, and his chest showed big and massive yet, but he lay as if in a stupor. We left Etchem with him, and went into the next hut, which Etchem had resigned to us. The jungle noises were no different there than anywhere else for months past, and I was soon fast asleep. Chapter 5 Sometime in the pitch dark, I found myself awake and listening. I could hear two voices, one stones, the other sibilant and wheezy. I knew Stone's voice after all the years that had passed since I heard him last. The other was like nothing I remembered. It had less volume than the wail of a newborn baby, yet there was an insistent carrying power to it, like the shrilling of an insect. As I listened, I heard Van Reeten breathing near me in the dark. Then he heard me and realised that I was listening too. Like Etchem, I knew little Balunda, but I could make out a word or two. The voices alternated with intervals of silence between. Then, suddenly, both sounded at once and fast. Stone's baritone basso, full as if he were in perfect health, and that incredibly stridulous falsetto, both jabbering at once, like the voices of two people quarrelling and trying to talk each other down. I can't stand this, said Van Reeden. Let's have a look at him. He had one of those cylindrical electric night candles. He fumbled about for it, touched the button, and beckoned me to come with him. Outside of the hut, he motioned to me to stand still, and instinctively turned off the light, as if seeing made listening difficult. Except for a faint glow from the embers of the bearer's fire, we were in complete darkness. Little starlight struggled through the trees, the river made but a faint murmuring. We could hear the two voices together, and then suddenly the creaking voice changed into a razor-edged slicing whistle, indescribably cutting, continuing right through Stone's grumbling torrent of croaking words. Good God! exclaimed Van Reeten. Abruptly, he turned on the light. We found Etchem, utterly asleep, exhausted by his long anxiety and the exertions of his phenomenal march, and relaxed completely, now that the load was in a sense shifted from his shoulders to Van Reeten's. Even the light on his face did not wake him. The whistle had ceased, and the two voices now sounded together. Both came from Stone's cot, where the concentrated white ray showed him lying just as we had left him except that he had tossed his arms above his head and had torn the coverings and bandages from his chest. The swelling on his right breast had broken. Van Reeten aimed the centre line of the light at it, and we saw it plainly. From his flesh, grown out of it, there protruded a head. Such a head as the dried specimens Etchem had showed us, as if it were a miniature of the head of a Belunda fetishman. It was black, shining black as the blackest African skin. It rolled the whites of its wicked wee eyes and showed its microscopic teeth between lips repulsively negroid in their red fullness. 
even in so diminutive a face. It had crisp, fuzzy wool on its minikin skull. It turned malignantly from side to side and chittered incessantly in that inconceivable falsetto. Stone babbled brokenly against its patter. Van Reeton turned from Stone and waked Etchum with some difficulty. When he was awake and saw it all, Etchum stared and said not one word. You saw him slice off two swellings, Van Reeton asked. Etchum nodded chokingly. Did he bleed much? Van Reeton demanded. Very little, Etchum replied. You hold his arms, said Van Reeton to Etchum. He took up Stone's razor and handed me the light. Stone showed no sign of seeing the light or of knowing we were there, but the little head mewled and screeched at us. Van Reeton's hand was steady, and the sweep of the razor even and true. Stone bled amazingly little, and Van Reeton dressed the wound as if it had been a bruise or scrape. Stone had stopped talking the instant the excrescent head was severed. Van Reeton did all that could be done for Stone, and then fairly grabbed the light from me. Snatching up a gun, he scanned the ground by the cot, and brought the butt down once and twice, viciously. We went back to our hut, but I doubt if I slept. Chapter 6 Next day, near noon, in broad daylight, we heard the two voices from Stone's hut. We found Etchum dropped to sleep by his charge. The swelling on the left had broken, and just such another head was there, meawling and spluttering. Etchum woke up, and the three of us stood there and glared. Stone interjected hoarse vocables into the tinkling gurgle of the portent's utterance. Van Reeton stepped forward, took up Stone's razor, and knelt down by the cot. The atomy of a head squealed a wheezy snarl at him. Then suddenly, Stone spoke English. Who are you with my razor? Van Reeton started back and stood up. Stone's eyes were clear now and bright. They roved about the hut. The end, he said. I recognise the end. I seem to see Etchum as if in life. But Singleton, ah, Singleton, ghosts of my boyhood come to watch me pass. And you, strange spectre, with the black beard and my razor. Aroint ye all! I'm no ghost stone, I managed to say. I'm alive. So are Etchum and Van Reeton. We are here to help you. Van Reeton, he exclaimed. My work passes on to a better man. Luck go with you, Van Reeton. Van Reeton went nearer to him. Just hold still a moment, old man, he said soothingly. It will be only one twinge. I've held still for many such twinges, Stone answered quite distinctly. Let me be, let me die in my own way. The Hydra was nothing to this. You can cut off ten, a hundred, a thousand heads, but the curse... You cannot cut off, or take off. What's soaked into the bone won't come out of the flesh any more than what's bred there. Don't hack me any more. Promise. His voice had all the old commanding tone of his boyhood, and it swayed Van Reeden as it always had swayed everybody. I promise, said Van Reeden. Almost as he said the word, Stone's eyes filmed again. Then we three sat about Stone and watched that hideous, gibbering prodigy grow up out of Stone's flesh till two horrid, 
spindling little black arms disengaged themselves. The infinitesimal nails were perfect to the barely perceptible moon at the quick. The pink spot on the palm was horridly natural. These arms gesticulated, and the right plucked towards Stone's blonde beard. I can't stand this, Van Rieten exclaimed, and took up the razor again. Instantly, Stone's eyes opened hard and glittering. Van Rieten break his word, he enunciated slowly. Never! But we must help you, Van Rieten gasped. I'm past all help and all hurting, said Stone. This is my hour. This curse is not put on me. It grew out of me, like this horror here. Even now, I go. His eyes closed and we stood helpless, the adherent figure spouting shrill sentences. In a moment, Stone spoke again. You speak all tongues? he asked quickly, and the emergent minikin replied in sudden English. Yea, verily, all that you speak, putting out its microscopic tongue, writhing its lips and wagging its head from side to side. We could see the thready ribs on its exiguous flanks heave as if the thing breathed. Has she forgiven me? Stone asked in a muffled strangle. Not while the stars shine on Lake Pontchartrain will she forgive. And then Stone, all with one motion, wrenched himself over on his side. The next instant, he was dead. When Singleton's voice ceased, the room was hushed for a space. We could hear each other breathing. Twombly, the tactless, broke the silence. I presume, he said, you cut off the little minikin and brought it home in alcohol. Singleton turned on him a stern countenance. We buried Stone, he said, unmutilated as he died. But, said the unconscionable Twombly, the whole thing is incredible. Singleton stiffened. I did not expect you to believe it, he said. I began by saying that although I heard and saw it, when I look back on it, I cannot credit it myself. What fascinates me about this story is that it's one of the only examples I've found of horror by accretion. The first sense of unease you get here is not the natives, not the alien landscape for the white characters that they are making their way across, but the fact that this is not the first group of white men to come through. There's a sense of something being pre-spoiled, of the rot having already set in, which makes the exact nature of the rot, as we find out, all the more terrifying and complex. I love how cold and measured the story is, how cool in the old-fashioned sense, how it emphasizes the shape the marks leave, like the footprints the white men leave, over what comes from the marks. I love, too, how this is accepted as a simple practicality of the profession. After all, which explorers can honestly say they have never had to cut fully formed homunculi of the culture they're colonizing out of their skin? That's the last thing you do before you go home for tea and medals, right? Except... Of course, that's nothing of the sort, except this builds and builds until the only thing that can happen does. Except, of course, that in the end there's no escape both from the new flesh and from the sense of justice to its choices. After all, why should colonization be a one-way street? This deeply unpleasant, clear-gazed, fantastically inventive piece of body horror could have been written in any decade in the last 12 a gloriously unsettling, tense piece. Thanks to Alex and Sean for discovering it. We just started paying associate editors, who are slush readers, by the way, and the first line of contact for every magazine and every author. They are the unsung heroes of the industry, and we feel it's time that they were sung. 
We're currently paying all four shows associate editors at a reduced rate because we aren't quite at the target amount of donations yet, but it was time to start this ball rolling, so we still need your help. Especially as, in addition, you also pay for literally everything else. Stories, staff, tech, you name it, so thank you. And if you can, please either donate time or money. For time, it's easy. Did you like this story? Then talk about it on social media, leave a review, anything like that helps like you would not believe. Money, literally the only thing that helps more. You can subscribe and get free audio goodies galore from as little as five bucks a month through either Patreon or PayPal. And if you have Amazon Prime, with five minutes, you could support us with five bucks a month for free through Twitch. There's been a lot of requests for information on this. So if you go to escapeartists.net forward slash Twitch, and I'll make sure that goes in the show notes, that will walk you through how to get it done. We're back next week with The Sea Thing by Frank Belknap Long. Audio production will be by Chelsea once again, narration by Andrew Lehman, and hosting by my bad self. Will be a production of Escape Artist Incorporated, released under a Creative Commons attribution, non commercial, no derivatives license. And we leave you with this quote from The Lighthouse Boredom makes men to villains. See you next time, folks. It's a pseudopod, it's a big foot. It's all about podcasts these days.